Good morning. Welcome to CSBA's webinar, Schools In for Summer, Strategies for Successful Summer Programs and Beyond. Before we begin, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items for those of you that might not be familiar with the GoToWebinar platform. Uh, you currently should have on your screen a dashboard that looks something like this. At the end of the presentation, we will have a question and answer segment where we will try our best to answer all of your questions. Um, to do so in your dashboard, there is a segment for questions, um, a little tab that you'll notice on there. Um, this is located on the side of your screen. If you don't see the dashboard currently, it may be collapsed. So you'll find an orange arrow up near the top that if you click it, um, it should expand the dashboard in full. Next slide, please. We are very excited to welcome a distinguished panel today um, of folks who bring a wide range of expertise and experience around summer learning. Um, we think that these um, presenters today will be able to give you both some research grounding and best practices grounding, as well as the local perspective in terms of what it might look like on the ground. So to begin with, uh, we will have Jessica Gunderson, Senior Advisor, Policy and Communications uh, Partnership for Children and Youth. And we will also be joined by three trustees, the first being Eileen Miranda Jimenez, the board president for West Covina USD, Paul Wallace, trustee from Newman Crows Landing USD, and Richard Barrera, the board president for San Diego USD. I'm your moderator, Mary Briggs, the director of research and education policy development here at CSBA. And we are looking forward to sharing this content with you today. Next slide, please. So we have been on countless webinars, I am sure, um, where we've talked about the impact of the pandemic on California's students. And that is an impact that has both highlighted um, that the existing inequalities in California, um, as well as exacerbated them due to some economic factors and some of the issues around uh, technological access and the impact of the illnesses on families. Um, due to that impact, we know that um, there are going to be a high amount of student needs as we begin to return to the classroom. And many schools are back, um, but kind of getting back to what used to be normal isn't going to be quite good enough anymore. And so we're thinking about the ways that we can welcome our students back to school in a way that is both safe, but that addresses all of the challenges that they have faced so that they're ready to learn. And to do so, we have a series of federal and state resources that have been allocated specifically to address learning recovery, including uh, the role of mental and social emotional health, which we know lays the foundation for our students to be able to learn. This webinar is part one of CSBA's two-part series, Supporting Governance Teams, on how to use the money to have the most impact for our students. Next slide, please. Our second webinar uh, will focus on learning recovery beyond the summer, um, more broadly into the next academic year and beyond. Uh, among those things, we want to make sure that we call out for you a few timelines that we have um, on the horizon, because we know that board members have been operating in, in a state of flux throughout this uh, past year. And there have been so many needs that, that we've been kind of focused on a day-to-day -day basis, but we wanna make sure that um, we have the long-term vision uh, as well. And there are a few deadlines creeping up on us. One of them is the Expanded Learning Opportunities Grant through the AB 86 um, legislation. Um, one of the things we want to highlight for you is that the grant template must be adopted by the Board of Education by June 1st um, and transmitted to the county 
Office of Education um, no later than five days after adoption. At least 85% of that funding must go to learning recovery and you must seek stakeholder feedback prior to adoption, much as you do with your LCFF. However, you do not need to do this separate from LCFF uh, LCAP feedback um, so that they can be integrated, but it also must outline how the funding will align with the federal funds um, for relief as well. And once um, that plan has been adopted, the accountability portion of that will be um, the audit of actual expenses. The County Office of Education doesn't need to approve your plan uh, and you don't need to go back and notify anyone if you make changes along the way if needed. Go ahead to the next slide, please. And we're not going to go through each of these particular groups, but we just want to remind uh, you that your extended learning opportunity grants must address the learning recovery for the, a list of, at minimum, the following required student groups. I want to call out as well down at the bottom that you have a certain discretion to expand that um, based on local need um, through identification by certi certified staff. Next slide, please. So this comes from the template that CDE released on March 25th um, in relation to the different ways that you are allowed to spend money for your expended learning op extended learning opportunity grants. Uh, among them, they include extending instructional learning time. But within your summer learn, learning programs, you can definitely use the um, other buckets um, to address them. For, for instance, the integrated student supports or um, supports for credit deficient students or um, the different um, community learning hubs and so on. Next slide, please. And through the American Rescue Plan, we know that at least 20% of your SR2 money must be spent on learning recovery. Districts will have until um, September 2023 20, to obligate that money, but you will need to um, release a plan for um, in-service instruction, in-person instruction and continuity of services within 30 days of receipt of that funding. And um, you must seek public comment before making that plan public on your website. So with that said, let's go to the next slide. Those sources provide a tremendous opportunity for districts to provide summer learning programs as one of their first steps towards learning recovery moving forward. For today's webinar, we understand that there will be a range of needs and um, established programs within districts, um, and so we want to make sure that we are covering content that will address the needs of those who already have well-established programs, but that might want to tweak them just a little bit to adapt to the learning recovery needs. There may be some who have smaller existing programs, for instance, those who may have offered credit recovery in the past, uh, but that want to expand to address the broader needs highlighted by the pandemic. We have some who might be launching summer learning for the first time in several years um, due to budget issues in prior years. And so this may be kind of dipping your toes into the water for summer learning for the first time in a while. And there are those of you who might feel like it's not possible to run a summer learning program this year, but we want you to pay attention to this webinar as well, because we think that these um, tips and resources will help you develop programs for summer 2022. And the recovery funding that um, I just mentioned earlier allows districts um, to use that money for next summer as well. And so this may give you um, kind of the founding um, information that you know so that you can plan an effective program during the 2021-22 year. We also want to be realistic about what's possible for summer learning in the ideal world versus what's feasible for now. 
And with that said, next slide. I'd like to hand this over to my colleague, Jessica Gunderson, who will be sharing with us a lot of information about the research and best practices and resources related to summer learning. Thanks, Jessica. Thank you so much, Mary. Good morning, my name is Jessica Gunderson. It's an honor and a privilege to be here today with this esteemed panel. So thank you all for making time this morning. Uh, next slide, please. Um, Really quickly, I work with the Partnership for Children and Youth. It's a statewide intermediary organization uh, that's been working over 20 years across the state to expand the access and quality of expanded learning programs. One thing worth noting is our organization, alongside many others, including CSBA, ran a seven-year summer learning campaign. This campaign engaged hundreds of diverse schools, districts, and community-based organizations. And so I just want everyone to know that there's a lot of brain trust in existing resources and infrastructure that exists within our state. Um, and CSBA has a, a bunch of resources on this topic, which I know they'll share at the end. Next slide. So before we dig into the how, what are we talking about? So summer programs, don't and shouldn't look like traditional summer school. Most of the research and practice over the last decade has moved away from summer school because it doesn't work. Below you'll see a chart that's comparing summer learning and summer school. I'm not going to read all of this, but some of the things worth noting is that summer learning tends to be voluntary, summer school tends to be mandatory. Another important component of summer learning is that it's attended by a wide variety of students versus just those that are academically struggling. And we know that all students benefit from a diverse set of experiences and backgrounds when it comes to learning. I want to highlight a few of the core elements of summer learning programs, which you can see here on this slide. And I want to say first that these are grounded in the science on learning and development. So some of the um, things worth noting out as you're thinking about building out your summer programs, you really wanna broaden kids' horizons. New ideas, um, new experiences, maybe getting outside the classroom. Also, it should include a wide variety of activities, which really, including reading, writing, STEM, and really blends both um, academics and enrichment. We also want to make sure kids have an opportunity to build new skills, whether that's academically or socially, and also includes um, cooperation. So even more so than any other summer, we really want students to be working together in teams and groups and with new adults as well. And lastly, it's worth noting that all summer learning programs, and this was called out in AB 86, should try to include nutritious food, access to meals, as well as outdoor time. Next slide, please. So now I'm gonna dig into what the research says on summer learning. And I wanna note that the next few slides are all based on findings from the National Summer Learning Project. This was a nine year study, which was the largest and most comprehensive of summer learning to date. And one thing that was really important about this research, it's actually about implementation. And that's what's so important for all of us. And so what we do know is that when you do have high quality um, summer learning programs, you can really move the needle, both mitigating learning loss, but as well as making gains in English and math, as well as boosting social emotional skills and language acquisition, acquisition of our English learners. One thing to note, and I'll highlight this a few times, is that the impact of these programs um, is most robust when you have students involved in this program for two summers. So as we're all thinking about planning, we should be thinking about two summers. Now, with that said, quality, we know what quality is and the research has shown us. So what does quality mean in research? One is duration. So all of the research findings to date are based on a four to five week program. That's full day. And let me note this, and Mary brought this up. This is the gold standard. And we hope next summer you can plan for that. But I'll tell you right now, we know a lot of school districts that are doing less than four or five weeks 
And that's okay because what's important is they're bringing their young people back on campus, campus and exposing them to safe learning environments. Attendance. Attendance is the North Star. Without having kids participating in the program, it's all for nothing. And so I'll focus my next slide on what we know about attendance in summer. The two other um, key factors, factors to effective programming is quality instruction, and that's all about staffing, which we're going to talk about, as well as creating a positive climate. And summer is really unique and special in that way of creating a camp-like, fun, um, caring, enriching environment. Next slide, please. So I just want to note attendance in summer programs is always a challenge, Not and this summer even more so, because many students have been away from the classroom for far too long. So here's a few things to think about. One, you really need to start, when people say, where should I start with my summer program? Which students do you want to serve? And what are their needs, strengths, and assets? You really have to have an intentional design to meet student needs if you want to get the desired outcomes. And so some of this will include really linking to intentional learning goals, which you'll hear from some of our um, school board leaders below. But typically we see STEM, math as a big focus, literacy as a big focus. Another thing to think about is often for older youth, middle school and high school, you wanna to try to integrate school choice, voice and leadership. And with the real young students, we often see a play-based curriculum as well as a lot of focus on socialization. Positive climate, right? Students need to feel safe and wanting to be there. So there's a lot of emphasis on how to create a positive climate. And that really comes down to staff training and kind of what expectations have been set for all that are participating. And you've seen this a few times in the slides now. Almost all summer learning programs have a blend of academics and enrichment. And those enrichment activities should be connected to that academic learning that might be happening in the morning or throughout the school day. Next. When it comes to attendance, it's really about over-communicating with the families. They need to know when they're signing up how important attendance is, is that, and that this is, a high, this is an expectation that we will have for our young people and the families. And we really wanna emphasize all the benefits of summer learning to their students so they understand why summer learning is so important. And I, I wanna mention the over-communication when it comes to safety as well. What we've seen in summer uh, learning hubs and other reopening is that over communication is really what can help build trust and safety among our parents to make sure that they feel comfortable bringing their young people in there. And that often includes videos and pictures of showing what's going on in the classroom since they're not able to come. And not surprising, quality of staff is always one of the most important things. The next slide, please. Not surprising, planning undergirds everything else, right? The quality, the instruction, the staffing, it all comes from planning. Now the research says planning for summer learning programs should start in September. Well, that is the gold standard and that is the ideal. And hopefully we can take that into next year. But the fact of the matter is even those folks that have been running so summer programs for years and years did not start in September. And many districts that we're working right with right now start are just starting right now or things are underway. So it's not too late. What I want to call out in this slide from the RAND Corporation is two things. One, trying to get all the stakeholders at the table as you start to begin. And that includes public health, that includes trust, transportation and nutrition. It makes everything easier if everyone's around the table from the get-go. Two, that last piece on continuous improvement, I know this is a best practice already, but what we've seen is this needs to be embedded almost weekly. All the programs that started um, have been running learning hubs and in-person learning throughout the year. What we heard from them is continuous improvement was essential. They were checking in at the end of each week. What, what worked, what didn't work, what public health standards have changed, which haven't. So really build that into your model. Thank you, you can move on to the next one. Okay, I wanna focus on investing in staff because that's so important. In the past, funding has always been our number one challenge and this year it's staffing. So research tells us that the, the 
best, the most impact on our students is when academics are provided by credentialed content expert teachers. And again, this is the gold standard. This is not going to be happening across the state and in many places. The research does tell us a little bit about how do we attract teachers and staff to come in. And this is what they found to be successful. One is advertising it as a half day. And in some cases, my programs, teachers are working one or two hours, so maybe even less. So making clear this is not going to be a full day program for six weeks for teachers who are burnt out and have been overwhelmed. Small classes. What research shows us about not all learning, but particularly in the summer, is that you want a ratio of less than one to 15. And this is something teachers really appreciate. The other thing is building off the strengths of teachers. Often we advertise that they're gonna be able to do enrichment and other types of fun activities with their students, that space will be created, as well as an existing curriculum. I can't emphasize this enough, especially if you're just starting to plan. The research shows how using a pre-planned curriculum can be especially important to both have rigorous impact and teachers don't have time to create a full six week new uh, curriculum from scratch. So I want to mention that the fact that teachers can play a variety of roles. And this kind of touches on the fact that there's several staffing models out there right now, which can blend community-based organizations, our paraprofessionals, our administrators, and our teachers. So in some cases, we have teachers working full day. Many times they're leading the academic instruction for a half day. They can often train our community staff and paraprofessionals, as well as play an advisory role. And we've also seen teachers in some cases play a site director role. Next slide, please. So I wanna talk about creative staffing solutions. So with staffing being the number one challenge, we've been thinking outside the box about how do we get more caring adults that are qualified and trained into these summer programs. A few things I wanna highlight. One is higher education. We see a lot of pre-service teachers did not get their training hours. And so this is a great opportunity for new teachers or teachers that are in a training program. So advertising and doing outreach to your higher education institutions is vital and they want to play an active role. We've also seen many programs hire high school students. And I will say that AB 86 does allow for you to stipend high school students as long as it's connected to those target groups and learning goals. We've also seen many districts reach out to retired teachers who want to come back and provide support. And then no surprise, partnering with city, city agencies, parks and rec, community-based organizations has really expanded. The last few points I want to mention on staffing is more than any summer, we see that school districts are really planning to have more support staff. And by that, I mean social workers, mental health workers, psychologists, where they can, whether it's every day or once a week, based on the trauma that many of our students have gone to and gone through, as well as the adults. So a lot of the programs we've been working on, we've also ensured both extra breaks for the adults working in these full day programs, as well as um, social and emotional support. Last thing I want to note on this is what the research shows us is the collaboration between teachers, site leaders, paraprofessionals, and community-based organizations has translated into better programming throughout the year. And we know that there's going to be a lot more staff on campus next year to make sure we can accelerate learning for all students. Next staff, next slide, please. So I want to mention, this is the, um, a regional breakdown. Every single district, Every single school, no matter how big or large, is in one of these 11 regional districts for expanded learning. And so after today, if nothing else, you should find out who your regional lead is and go to them for resources. They have curriculum. They can provide training, facilitation. It's a great resource. So every, everyone in the state has um, these resources. And I'll go on my last slide. Great, so it can be hard to navigate all the resources. And what I'll tell you is there's an overwhelming amount. So I wanna highlight a few things. These are all linked, so don't worry about Googling them now. One is we have a webinar series that's been going on for the last month. Two of them are on staffing solution. One is on um, high school students. And then this week on Thursday, we're gonna be focused on early learners. There's a refresh summer learning guide that distills all this research into what's the most relevant and pressing for now. 
all that research I highlighted earlier on was from getting to work on summer learning. So really go there. They have calendars, they have tip sheets. It's really grounded in what you need at the ground level. And then lastly, I wanna mention this TA Hub, the Partnership for Children and Youth starting next week has been funded by the CCEE to provide technical assistance and support to any school district for programming this summer. So that will be an another resource. So with that, I would like to turn it over to our next distinguished speaker. So it's my pleasure to pass it off to Eileen Miranda Jimenez with West Covina. Thank you very much, Jessica. That was such an informative presentation. Thank you. I am Eileen Miranda Jimenez. I am currently the president of West Covina Unified School District. I've been a board member since 2009. Um, so I am excited and thrilled to be here with you to talk about our summer programming, which I am thrilled beyond belief the things that we're going to set out to do this year. Okay, next slide. Okay, so we um, are going to expand our summer learning program. In the past, over the last decade, we have slowly been adding to our summer learning. We expanded it to include elementary. So during the summertime, we have dual immersion, uh, bilingual education going on, and a dance camp. But because of the infusion of money, we are super excited as a district. And how we're gonna focus our, our resources this summer um, the biggest component is social emotional. Um, we are really looking forward to supporting our kiddos who have been home for over a year. Um, half of our district is currently doing, half of our elementary kiddos are currently doing learning still in over the computer. So we want to draw our students to the campus this current summer. So we're gonna, like I said, we're gonna focus on social emotional, literacy and math, um, physical fitness. We're making sure everything is STEAM, uh, science, technology. Um, we're adding in um, all the arts. And most importantly, in order to engage students who desperately are looking for that support, we wanna make it fun. We are utilizing our teachers and our parents um, as well as um, support staff. So we're pulling from a lot of different resources. But the biggest thing that we're doing this year that has me super excited is that we have put out an all call to our teachers and we are asking them, do you have a hobby, a skill, a passion? Would you like to get paid a week or two and teach our kiddos? So if you knit, if you garden, if you want to do speech and debate, um, whatever your passion is, we are looking to have you come in and um, instruct our students and not focus on the academic and, oh, this is learning, learning, but focus on the fun and doing something different. Next slide, please. Um, we anticipate serving over the course of the summer between 2,500 and 3,000 students. To give you context, the district is 8,500 students. So for our elementary kiddos, as I stated, we have slowly over the last decade been expanding our elementary. So um, uh, we are now just, we, we did it on steroids. So all of our delivery is going to be in person and that's gonna be really important. There is gonna be no computer web-based docu uh, screenshot, uh, shoot in. We are gonna do it all in person. And what we are adding this year, thanks to the funding we're getting, is the TK and, and kindergarten literacy boot camp. Um, and we are gonna begin that right before school. So we're gonna bring those kiddos in early August. And that way they can transition because there are little kiddos um, and they're gonna need some time. So we're super excited. And as I mentioned, we've already done dual immersion. Uh, we are up to uh, fifth graders this year. So for the last five years we've done dual immersion um, and we've done dance, but we're now gonna add coding, et cetera. Okay, if we can move on to the high school. For high school, what we've traditionally have provided in, in the past has been both credit recovery and I call it first credit 
uh, students who want to get ahead. We have social science courses at the high school level, and we have uh, PE. We've expanded to PE, Spanish, and a few other courses if you're trying to get initial credit. Um, and it, we, like I said, we also do credit recovery. We also um, have a middle school curriculum. You can take a look and read the slides there. But um, what we're adding for all of the students in middle and high school is also that, that component of having uh, fun courses that students can do. Uh, the other thing that we've done traditionally in the past is a college boot camp. Um, so we'll be expanding all of that. Uh, okay, next slide, please. The other component that we are expanding this summer is our special education. We have found that it is very successful to keep our special education students uh, June and if need be uh, through part of July. We then give students a break of about a month and then they come back in when the school year starts. We have found that to be the most successful and least disruptive for students and their families. So um, we are going to offer extended day courses. We are, we're looking at our extended day courses to be about four weeks in length. We have a camp friendship that we're going to be doing this morning. Uh, in the morning time, I apologize. Um, what's really important here on that very last bullet is in the morning time we're providing curriculum and since we have so much support staff that is coming in our paraprofessionals etc we are going to be doing training in the afternoon and I, we have listed there on that bullet all the different training that we are going to take on with our paraprofessionals that we are very excited about we have had little to no training in the past for our paraprofessionals. So this is really good and we're appreciative of the money. Next slide, please, which this is my final slide. Um, foster and homeless youth and mental health. We are going to focus also on expanding our foster and homeless programs over the summer. Uh, this will be in July. It'll be about three to four weeks. Um, and the reason why I can't give you a definitive is we are basing it on the availability of our staff. We commit to three weeks. We're hoping to expand it to four. Um, and we are going to do, provided that the county allows us to, um, to include field trips, we are going to add field trips this summer, which, again, is amazing for our students because so many of them have not been able to go beyond the four walls of their home. Um, so these are the things that we're going to be offering. And we have psychologists that are coming in at all levels. The other thing is, in addition to our paraprofessionals, I'll close with, because we have additional staff and teachers, we are, again, making afternoon training available, which is very exciting. So I will now turn it over to my colleague, Richard Barrera. All right, thanks so much, I mean, got it. So exciting um, what you're doing in West Covina. Um, so yeah, I just wanna uh, talk a little bit about uh, uh, what we're doing in San Diego Unified. So uh, just for a little context, um, I just wanna make sure my webcam is on. Uh, I think it's on, okay. So, um, for a little context, uh, our district is a pre-K to 12 district. We've got a little over 100,000 students uh, at our district schools and uh, about another 20,000 at charter schools that are uh, um, overseen by our district. Uh, about two thirds of our students qualify for free and reduced lunch. About 25% of our students are English learners. About 15% have IEPs, and about 7% of our students are homeless. Uh, so uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so what we're doing is we're um, constructing our summer program uh, in partnership with our entire you know, community-based sector. So, um, we're labeling our program uh, Level Up San Diego, a summer of learning and joy. And our key partner in this is the local community foundation, the San Diego Foundation. 
and I'll describe that partnership in a little bit. So next slide, please. So the basic structure is that students will go to school uh, in the morning, five days a week for four hours. At the elementary school level, uh, we're planning a uh, four-week program that will begin uh, June 21st and uh, focus on science, literacy, and math. And then uh, secondary school uh, will be two three-week sessions um, that begin June 21st, and they'll be consecutive sessions, so students could enroll in both, uh, in both sessions. We will maintain an online option, particularly around credit recovery uh, for, for students who need that and are yet um, are not yet comfortable coming in person. And just again, for some context, about half of our students are now coming in in person and about half are staying online. And that's the choice of parents. Uh, next slide. So the, um, what we wanna do is in the mornings again, four hours a day, five days a week, have students uh, coming into school and that, is is a focus on project-based learning at both the elementary and uh, secondary levels. But then in the afternoons, we want to make available uh, a whole host of community-based programs. So we as a district have invested $5 million into the local community foundation, the San Diego Foundation. And the intention is that um, the foundation will then make micro grants available to nonprofit organizations. And actually, an RFP is already uh, out, and those uh, proposals are due on Friday. And so, we're expecting to see, you know, a lot of uh, different creative options everything from uh, swim camps and surf camps to music and arts, uh, science uh, camps. Uh, again, very neighborhood-based programs in some uh, situations and programs that are available to students throughout the city. And then we will make as a district transportation available to take our students from school in the morning to the after-school programs that uh, parents will select. On our website, we will have a portal that will allow parents to go in and see the menu of uh, after-school options that are available. And then, and then parents can sign up um, uh, based on you know, which community-based programs they most uh, want their kids to uh, participate in. Next slide, please. So you know, the recruitment of teachers, you know, we heard both uh, Jessica and Eileen talk about the importance of that. You know, that's a work in progress. We are actively recruiting teachers now um, we actually uh, are uh, going to the bargaining table with our different bargaining units to talk about incentives on top of the uh, summer school pay that's already built into the contract. So we're certainly hoping to attract a good number of teachers. Um, and then, you know, many of the strategies that Jessica highlighted in terms of reaching out to retirees, reaching out to students in schools of education, uh, you know, we, we intend to, uh, to use those strategies as well for the school-based portion, and then we know that the community-based organizations um, will have uh, a, a variety of staffing options, including stipending uh, high school students to support their programs. Next slide, please. Yeah, and in addition to the micro grants that we're uh, doing through the San Diego Foundation, um, we're partnering with the City of San Diego, which is expanding its uh, park and rec programs. We're partnering with the Community College District to make uh, college courses available to our high school students, as well as to the uh, University of California at San Diego which has a host of, uh, of uh, credit uh, programs that you know, would be available to high school students as well. Next slide, please. So this is just you know, too uh, uh, detailed to see, but this is a map of uh, where we intend to have school-based programs. So our district covers roughly the boundaries of the city of San Diego, so we're a big, uh, diverse, 
district geographically. Um, in the southern part of the district, we tend to have um, more students who qualify for free and reduced lunch. Um, and so we're trying to heavily concentrate our school-based programs in the southern part of the district, but we will have coverage uh, in all of the uh, uh, high school clusters, uh, the elementary and middle schools that feed into our comprehensive high schools. And 11 of our 16 comprehensive high schools will themselves be sites uh, for the school-based program. Next slide, please. And, you know, as um, I think all of us are thinking about, you know, this is, uh, this is a summer that we're going to learn. We have not had uh, anything beyond, you know, extended school year and credit recovery for high school seniors uh, for well over a decade. This is actually my 13th year on the school board, and um, we've never had a summer program that's available to students at all grade levels. Um, but we intend to continue it beyond this summer, certainly for the next couple of summers uh, with use of the, uh, the federal money. And we're trying to build a program that we can make, you know, permanent and sustainable. So, you know, we, we will uh, uh, identify an entity to do an outside evaluation of the program, as well as, you know, conduct exit surveys um, with, our, with our students and our, and our staff and the community-based organization. Okay, so that's all I have, and um, my pleasure to now uh, turn it over to Paul Wallace. There it is. No way. There I am. Um, thank you so much. I really appreciate what the great presentations um, West Covina and San Diego did, and so um, if you'll move on to my next slide, please. Um, I wanted to um, kind of introduce Newman Crow's Landing, not quite as famous as West Covina or San Diego. Uh, we're in the Valley, 3,200 students. Um, and uh, I'm not gonna cover a lot of the same, uh, West Covina and um, San Diego's presentation did a really great job. We're doing a lot of the same kind of programs. Um, we are organized into camps. I'll talk a little bit more about that. And one thing that we did add is we are doing academic counseling. So our counselors and our students haven't had a chance to talk and think about college and, and uh, master schedule. So we'll be doing that as well. Uh, next slide, please. Um, we are funding our um, summer school program, our added summer school with uh, extended learning opportunity grant that state fund good for two years. Um, so we're planning for extended summer school 21 and 22. Um, we've, we've always offered a little bit of summer school, uh, we're expanding the sites, we're expanding the students. Um, summer school in Newman Crow's Landing has always meant something different, um, making it fun, we're covering standards, but we're doing it in a fun way. Um, next slide, please. So this is an example of one of the camps that's being offered at the, um, Middle school and high school level, we opened it up to staff, both teachers and administrators and certificated people. If you have something you're passionate about, offer it. If enough students sign up, that class goes. Um, the elementary, we're doing more themes, um, lots of science. Um, and uh, something to notice just about the slide that's up, you know, it's Harry Potter, middle school kids, that's a lot of excitement. There's hands-on stuff, uh, making slime and drone races, and, and they are doing writing. So um, next slide, please. Um, we know the kids are suffering in a big way, and they need some help to get, get um, uh, academically back on track. Um, but something that we as a district set ourselves aside and said this is going to be, you know, core with us is we want to spend this largesse in with our current staff, um, as opposed to, start, you know, buying some program, bringing in some consultant. A lot of what we'd like to do with our money is spend it on our staff. Um, one of the ways that we're doing this, which solves, you've heard a lot about staffing. Normally, we pay a stipend for our um, teachers, our certificated staff for summer school. 
This year we're paying them their per diem rate, which is more generous, and we've done something similar coming up with a with a blended and average rate for our um, certificate or our classified staff. And so everybody's getting paid a little bit more. That's encouraging more staff to come out. Um, and um, we are hiring a lot more staff than we normally do. So that's ways that we're spending this largesse on our staff. But I do want to point out. Um, for us, summer school is outside of our um, negotiated contract. There's going to be a lot of pressure to add this um, COVID money into the step and columns of the regular, and that's going to make something really ugly happen in a couple of years when this money goes away. You're going to be laying people off or, or squashing programs or asking your, your unions to take a cut in pay. Um, next slide, please. Um, one of the things as we've gone through uh, the rigor relevance and relationship process that kind of guides our district, the model schools program, we realize that not all standards are the same. And um, all of us would trade really great reading comprehension if we weren't able, if we gave short shift to say semicolons. And I love semicolons, but um, we would certainly trade good reading comprehension for that. Um, so we are giving our um, our teachers the opportunity to prioritize standards and give some short shrift to some standards that are not as important as those students move forward. Um, and this summer school, we're covering basically mathematics and reading. Um, and we're using these fun activities and we're limiting our, our standards that we're trying to cover. Um, but we're really motivated about making sure that students have the important standards covered because that's what they need to move forward. Next uh, slide, please. Um, accountability, kind of one of the interesting things that we discovered about the summer school programs that we've done in the past is we tend to see some attrition of fourth through sixth graders especially. And so that's something we're going to be watching. It's, it's pretty easy to watch. Um, uh, and that's one of the things that we're going to be using as a measure. We'll do a, a, uh, an end of the season um, uh, survey of both parents and, and students. And then most importantly, we're planning that review process. We're going to go through, we're looking at this being a two-year program because the um, extended up learning opportunities grant is, is available for two years. So we're planning it for next year and we're already planning end of this year, we're going to go um, evaluate and see how things are um, to make those plans for next year. Next slide, please. And this next slide, I'm not going to cover in depth. It's the, I think you're all going to get copies of the slide deck. These are just some tips that we came across. Um, there was some questions about staffing that came up. So my, what's that, two and a half topic is, we're allowing our administrators and our classifieds, um, the high school principal teaching a drone class, uh, an elementary school principal is doing um, the WOW uh, Wonders of Science Museum, but she's actually going to teach that herself in addition to what um, her staff is going to be teaching those students during their themes. Um, and uh, one of our um, LVNs is going to be teaching a class. So we've opened it up beyond just our traditional certificated teachers and allowing some other people to do this, this fun work. Um, and then there were some questions that came up earlier about getting um, other organizations involved. Um, so some of the things that we've been able to do with that, we have a uh, reduce, reuse, recycle theme to one of our elementary schools, and they're using a county agencies bringing in examples of recycled goods. And uh, we've got a local alpaca farm, the, the county um, wildlife agency and our police canine for an animal theme at the elementary schools. And then finally, every time my wife and I go to a history talk or go to look at pretty pictures at a museum, um, a lot of those places already have curriculum and a, a system in place. And um, most of the time it's, it's fun to look at that and go, yeah, but we can't fit that in amongst the standards of the normal school day. So. Maybe, you know, every one of those buildings and associations you drive by, they might be a good source for that stuff. Um, sports are popular, drones are popular. And with that, I will pass it back to Mary Briggs for questions and answers. Thank you so much. So 
really want to thank our panelists um, for the tremendous range of content that they've covered throughout this webinar, both from the research perspective and resources to the on the ground planning that you're seeing unfold um, across a range of districts. I'm going to ask our panelists to all um, turn their cameras back on for the Q&A. So, we have some questions that were submitted in advance of the webinar um, today and uh, as well. We just want to let those of you who are attending today have the opportunity to add your questions as well. So if you notice on your uh, uh, dashboard, there is a section um, titled questions. If you don't see um, the document opened to a text box for opening, if you click on the little triangle on the left of the word questions, it should open up that text box for you so that you can submit your questions. We're going to try and get to as many of them as we can, including the ones that were submitted um, at registration. So I think that you've covered a lot of ground today, but want to kind of touch base on a few issues around um, creative ways that um, you can staff a summer programs or partner with existing organizations. So Jessica offered some suggestions as, as one piece. Um, Richard, why don't you start by talking a little bit about the microgrants program that um, you're using in San Diego? Oh, Richard's doing a Mary right now. Yeah. So. <laughs> uh -oh. Sorry about that, yeah. So, um, yeah, we knew that we needed to pull in, you know, the entire community in support of our students this summer, but we also know that, you know, our existing community-based nonprofit sector has, you know, limited capacity. And so, if we wanted to really involve them in a serious way, we had to make sure that we could help fund uh, their capacity, uh, you know, to support our students. So, you know, so we've invested uh, $5 million. Uh, into this micro grant program, we reached out to our community foundation, the San Diego Foundation, uh, to administer the program because you know they've got a much more expertise than we do in uh, working through you know RFPs for community-based organizations, making selections, um, trying to figure out how to um, you know build out uh, a really comprehensive uh, you know uh, network of community-based organizations. So. So they've been doing that. They put an RFP out on the street a couple of weeks ago. Um, we already have uh, many, many community organizations that have responded and the due date is on Friday. And, you know, we're interested in, if we end up having, you know, uh, great proposals, um, you know, that go beyond our initial $5 million investment, we're certainly open to looking at expanding that investment as well. That would be a good problem for us to have because it would indicate, you know, that there's more capacity in the community than, um, you know, than we had originally anticipated. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's a great partnership. Obviously, we've got a number of community organizations that work with our schools every day and have for years. But, you know, we also have a lot of programs in the community that, um, you know, frankly, are great programs, but have only been available to families who can afford them. And so, you know, opening them up for all of our families is something that we're, you know, we're excited about. Thank you. Um, anyone else want to chime in on creative ways for establishing or expanding partnerships for summer learning? I'll just mention one that didn't, uh, I don't think get called out is the libraries. So we see in a lot of our communities that the libraries are running summer programs and sometimes honestly full and half day programming. Um, and those are particularly good for early learners um, when you can get um, parents engaged at the library sites because they have a array of both feeding sites, they can be uh, job centers. So I would just wanted to call out the libraries as um, specific staffing and sometimes the staff even come into the school site. Paul kind of was mentioning some of the history pieces. It's not just about literacy. They do, they have whole modules when it comes to California history or local history as well. 
thank you. Actually, Jessica, while you're here, uh, one question um, that I was thinking you might be able to address um, in some of our conversations about um, those districts that might not be able to launch a full program this year. You mentioned that it might be useful to provide some other resources for families. Do you want to speak to that a moment? Yeah, I think, um, so what we have seen is some school districts kind of just, it, it's too late for them. Um, maybe they're having a lot of difficulty um, in their negotiations. And so we have seen school districts have to change some of their contracting deadlines. And I think with COVID school boards, and these are the school board members, um, have had to be more flexible. So often we'll have contracting deadlines in April for summer programming, and that just doesn't work. So I would say to all the board members, that's something you have control over, is you can move those deadlines. Um, and then the other piece is we've had a lot of CBOs say, we don't need any money from the school. All we need is the facility. We need the school to open up because this is where the community and the young people need to get grounded. So I would say another thing is if school districts even thinking about how are we creatively using our facilities, um, even if we might not have the resources or don't want to get you know too in the weeds with some contracts, it's another um, space. And last, I wanted to touch on what Eileen mentioned around training. We're also seeing not only paying teachers more this summer, but paying for planning and collaboration time that they've always asked for in the summer for them to prepare for the following school year. So if that can be another carrot to get them there, I think um, we've seen a few folks really build that in on top of the increased uh, wages and salaries. I have a question and I know we're a panelist, we're supposed to be taking them from the audience, but this discussion is generating. So can we use the money to pay community organizations, as Jessica just said, the library, Richard and Paul talked about museums and uh, to pay them and send our kids over there, or do we have to bring these organizations onto our campus and host them on our campus, but then send our children to their programming, their museum sponsored event or, or the library event? What is the rule on the, the money from the state and the Fed? I can only so speak I, to the state money, and I okay. and I will say, as long as you're serving, this is this is our interpretation. As long as you're serving the target population, which is the most important, right? And they're linked to learning goals and learning recovery, which and it, I mean, quite honestly, integrated student supports. So we do see some districts fully contracting out and offsite, especially okay. last summer when we really didn't open schools. There were some in-person learning that happened on community-based sites. They were kind of like school-age childcare. So, so I would say, again, long as target population, and I can't speak to the federal dollars, target population and learning goals, you've met the, the guidelines. Thank you. I yeah, I, you know, we're, of, I'm sorry, go ahead, Paul. Oh, thanks. Uh, I have a couple of comments, and it comes down to thinking about the schools maybe less about money and more about resources. We have sites. Um, where communities could come on and do things. And we have this incredible relationship with so much of our community, the families and the students. If somebody wants to know, if I could you know, bring a counselor, do you think anybody could use their services? We know those answers. And we, we have the, the, the email or the address to say, hey, would you like to have some counseling service? Somebody would like to bring it. And we're willing to let them use this building or something. So those are a couple of things that I've been thinking a lot about lately is, is resources beyond money. Thanks. Yeah, and I would just say, you know, our, our intention is certainly to, to do both. Um, so to make our facilities available to community-based partners, you know, for the afternoon activities and to actually make transportation available to, um, you know, be, be able to take students, you know, uh, either to the community-based partners or, you know, even, um, you know, to, to school sites where we might have different community activities going on, um, but also to, you know, make use of existing community facilities. So, for instance, even the academic portion uh, in the morning of our elementary school program will include a partnership with Balboa Park and the zoo. Um, so, you know, we're, we've got a, this sort of project-based uh, geocaching, uh, you know, uh, uh, program that students will use uh, math and literacy and science uh, to then kind of go out and map 
and uh, do kind of a, you know, a treasure hunt at Balboa Park and the zoo. And so we'll, you know, we'll take students there. So, yeah, I mean, we've got, you know, obviously uh, a lot of great facilities in, in our community that we want to uh, make available to our students and then also make sure that our school facilities are available to our partners. Thank you. So we have a question from the audience um, uh, that's asking, um, are any background checks completed for those not affiliated with the school district or a youth organization? Is anyone able to speak to that question? We background check everybody. So yes, if you're going to be presenting or a maintaining space on our campus yes there has to be and we do the live scan on at the district office thank you another question from the audience um, can someone talk more about bringing high school students on board to assist with teaching and would this be applicable to college students as well i i can tell you that in our district at this point we haven't expanded the net to high school or college. However, we encourage them to apply for any position that's available. So, because at this point, our first round is going to our teachers and the staff that's currently there, but we're open to the idea and we'll post jobs as necessary. In our, yeah, and in our, in our uh, micro grants, um, you know, we, we know and, and that that many of the community-based organizations are planning to hire high school students you know to be part of their program and they and they often you know we know that they often do that uh you know during the summer uh in in past years so we're we're we as a district are you know would not be hiring high school students directly for the school-based programs but the community-based organizations through the micro grants we expect to see a lot of high school students offered internships whether it's summer school directly but we do that during our regular portion of our year we bring um, high school students down to work as um, uh, tutors and whatnot uh, whether we're specifically doing that in summer school i can't really speak to but i will also point out that if you're doing col college and career readiness and you haven't thought about education as a career you just fell off the chair and hit your head you should be having that as part of your college and career readiness you're the biggest employer in most cities so. Yes, and I think that something that we've heard as folks talk about um, the staff that they bring on for summer learning programs, you know, when you are doing the training like we're seeing in West Covina for paraprofessionals, you're developing um, the possibility that those um, staff um, and maybe even folks from after school programs, traditional programs, many of those um, staff members are interested in entering into education. And so this is an opportunity for them to get the training and the experience um, and to strengthen that teacher pipeline for um, your community. And I know that that's an issue that many districts are facing is teacher shortages. So I think that's a, an important consideration. Um, Can I just add, there, there actually is a paper on using summer learning as a pathway for, for teachers. So I will be sure to share that with the audience afterwards. Thank you. Um, let's see. We have another question from a member of the audience. Um, are the college and high school students like tutors under certificated supervision? And is there anything more that we can talk about working with college students and student teachers? Yeah, I, I would just say, um, so we're uh, having discussions with the schools of education in our region, uh, you know, and, and we think, you know, this, uh, the, the summer program can be a great, you know, uh, potential setting. I think Jessica referred uh, to that you know, for, uh, uh, you know, students in, um, in, their, in their education programs. So, you know, as we bring uh, students, you know, who are enrolled in uh, schools of education onto our campuses, obviously we've got to figure out the, you know, kind of the supervision and mentorship structure with certificated staff. Thank you. 
So one thing that we have not really touched on um, yet, although it's, it is an elephant in the room, and that is the health um, guidelines and planning around um, summer learning programs in the COVID context. So if you've heard from some of our districts and many of our members throughout the state have a significant portion of families that have not opted to return to in-person instruction at this time. Um, Jessica, you spoke to the importance of over-communicating to a degree, um, the amount of safety precautions that will be in place so that families feel comfortable sending their children in. Um, are there um, any comments that um, our panelists might want to make around how they're thinking about what those programs will look like in the COVID context? So for us, we are following the county guidelines. We did have special ed return back in September. So we followed all guidelines and there were times when one or two students or a staff member had to be quarantined and there was um, a few times where we had to shut down an entire cohort. So we are going to follow to the letter what the county puts out. Um, and so we're hopeful with more and more people getting vaccinated um, that we it'll be um, less and less of an issue, but we do recognize that we have to still follow those restrictions. The high school program is gonna be, in terms of credit recovery and first credit, the high school program will be online. So if somebody is exposed, they can still get learning via their daily instruction over the internet. Unfortunately for our elementary and our in-person learning, um, we would have to then quarantine if, if we're made aware or, um, or if there's an outbreak. So that's how our plans, that's what's in play at this point. Thank you. Yeah, we'll be following the same guidelines we currently are using for in-person learning. So, you know, all of the distancing guidelines, masking, you know, uh, the ventilation of the classrooms, all those things. The um, And we also have a, a testing program that we've been doing where, um, we, we do COVID testing on site for all students and staff every couple of weeks. So we'll continue that program through the, through the summer as well. Yeah, we have a, a program of doing the, um, the tracing and, and all that sort of thing. Um, I think one of the things that was kind of encouraging, I was in Walmart yesterday and the announcement overhead was that they had vaccines available, show up at the pharmacy and get your vaccine. So. Um, that makes me hopeful that hopefully this won't be as big of a deal as it has been the last few months. Wonderful. And Jessica, I believe that some of the resources that Partnership for Children and Youth have developed actually take lessons learned from offering summer learning programs um, last year. Um, is that correct? The, so I would say the only folks that offered in-person summer learning were summer camps, generally speaking, in some parks and rec last summer. Almost all school districts that I know of and CBOs offered um, virtual distance learning where there might have been some obviously dropping off of materials. But the research we did with um, AIR and PACE, which you can find is on the learning hubs, which started much earlier than school reopening to show how do you, and, and I would say this, to, for all is start small and grow larger. If it's, you don't have to start with 500 kids on, your, you know, it, what we've seen is if you start small and build confidence and trust among staff, students, and then your community, then th there's some flexibility to, to expand programming or offer it at more sites. And that's why I, I can't stress Everyone should be videotaping what's going on in the exciting summer program so they can be showing parents how happy, you know, that it feels safe. Even if you're using that for next school year, this is a great opportunity to document what this looks like and how it's done safely. Um, uh, and we've seen that really make a difference for parents. Then they might even come on, you know, for the bridge programs or come back in August a little earlier if they feel comfortable. Thank you. Um, Let's step back a little bit more broadly. Are there any particular implementation challenges um, that your districts are working through at the moment? Um, we've heard a little bit about staffing. Are there other questions um, that are currently under discussion? 
challenges may be in rolling out this year's programming. Uh, because I'll just jump in. So, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Eileen. Yeah. Oh, sorry, Richard. I, that excellent. That little moment to take you off of unmute. Right. There's a, the delay. Um, I was going to say, as you heard, staffing has been the biggest challenge. And then with staffing then comes, shall we say, that master calendar. Now putting all these puzzle pieces together. So that is our biggest challenge right now is determining who's going to do what and now when. Um, so that is what where we're at. And then, of course, as we said, then we have to process everybody, live scan, et cetera. So that is our big challenge right now. But it's a good challenge to have because the kids are coming back. So we welcome it. Yeah, absolutely. And similarly, uh, you know, obviously staffing will determine how many uh, students we can actually offer the program to. We're hoping, you know, to make it available to everybody, but we are prioritizing doing early enrollment right now for, you know, students in some of the categories that uh, uh, Jessica had been uh, taking us through. So, you know, we, I think a lot of districts, before we opened up in-person learning to all students, we had about 20% of our students that we had identified as, um, you know, uh, uh, being able to come on to, onto campus for in-person learning. And those were students with certain disabilities, homeless students, English learners, uh, students whose uh, teachers were identifying them as falling behind either academically or were worried about them social emotionally. So that group of students right now, we are actually enrolling um, already and we're reaching out to those families and recruiting them. And then in late May, we will open up enrollment to all, all families. I think probably one of the big things that we're seeing is transportation is a real issue. Um, we, we contract with the transportation company and they're just not able to get folks to come drive buses. Uh, to the point that we've got some students that, you know, for regular class that we're picking up with the, the, the FFA's vans, um, with just, you know, one of our regular uh, classified employees driving. Um, we'll, and so transportation is a big deal. I can tell you that in our, our walking campuses, we've got maybe half of our students are signing up for summer school in our um, real isolated small campus that's mostly um, bus served. Uh, we're looking at a very small percentage of the students that are signed up um, because most of those come from a community that has to kind of be there's a there's a housing development up the hill that the kids have to be bused down from um, and so they're just not as interested in, in summer school uh, that's a piece of it and then one of the things that's kind of interesting and it's a, it's a challenge to sort of try and solve but we're sort of looking at it and being very suspect of the assessment that's going on in distance learning since we're not right there helping the kids take their tests. And so we're trying to include in our distance learning program some assessment. So I'm getting the student with a teacher and understanding do their test scores reflect where that student is academically. And so that's sort of a challenge that, that goes along with this as well. Thank you. Well, I think we're coming to the end of our questions um, at this point. Um, perhaps maybe one more question around um, ways that we can encourage attendance. So um, when we were preparing this webinar, one of the things that um, we talked about, and Jessica highlighted this in her presentation, is how important attendance is um, for summer learning programs. Um, so from that study that Jessica was talking about, you know, they were looking at, um, let's say it's a 25 day program, the students would have needed to have attended about 20 days um, of that session um, to, to really see the gains. And so we know that part of the reason that the engagement um, component is so important is to make sure that students are showing up, um, you know, on campus. Um, are there, um, any suggestions um, or models that you've seen in terms of encouraging attendance during those programs? Well, I want to say that for us with attendance, we are looking at last year as an example at the high school level. There are so many hours that you have to attend in order to get credit. 
So we did not have as much of a problem with the tendons when you're trying to do credit recovery and first credit. So yes, we are looking at attendance at the elementary and middle school level where we're offering the fun classes. So that we're looking at making it fun and engaging and taking the academic pressure off so that um, students will feel uh, they want to come, they'll tell their, their classmates, they'll tell the other kids that are signed up. We're taking that pressure off to ease people in. And as Jessica stated, we are, um, we're big on PR. Uh, that has been my little mantra since I've been a board member's PR, PR, PR. So yes, we do post to Facebook, we do post to Instagram, everything that we're doing so that people can see it because that's that truly is our best tool um, is when people can see it, a picture is worth a thousand words. Um, so that is how we're handling it at this point. But you know, we can all debrief at the end of summer and see how it all went. <laughs> I mean, the only thing I would add is field trips. I mean, um, incentivizing field trips, particularly for like with the isolation that many kids feel in, in rural communities where um, kids are, are even more isolated. So we see that. And again, you have to attend this full week to get it. And you can, you might, you know, you're doing it in smaller groups. So I, I would say field trips, knock it out of the park. That's the, the best. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just really, really important this summer. And I, I think we're following a, a model similar to what the other districts are doing, where we let our secondaries um, kind of propose what they wanted to do. And so if, if they're doing something that's good and exciting and interesting, the kids are going to want to come. I do think that something that was interesting is, as our, the director of curriculum instruction was sharing what, what's going on with me, she was saying, you really notice that fourth to sixth graders tend to peter out. And so I think maybe one of the things to look at is in your elementary programs, thinking about your K-3 versus your 3-6 or something, they're pretty different developmentally. And I wonder if too many of our programs are interesting to a kindergartner and a fourth grader gets bored. And so maybe that's one to think about. Great, thank you. You mentioned the piece around um you know, staff um, options for um, presenting content. And Eileen, I think this question may have been addressed uh, to you because you were talking about the fact that um, you were encouraging people to propose classes um, and sessions. Um, and if there were enough people that signed up that it could be offered, was there kind of a, a threshold that um, you know is being used to kind of identify how many students would make it um, feasible for offering a particular course? You know, at, at this point, um, the pandemic is allowing us 16 people in a, court, in a classroom. So um, we have said, not for summer school, but in regular teaching, you know, if only five kids shown up, we're, we're good. So that is something I'm gonna go back and ask, what is our bottom line? Because we have not discussed that yet as a board. Um, though, again, we understand that it's about people feeling comfortable and sometimes you need to have only four or five people in a class before parents feel comfortable and then now you're going to see them no problem in August when the school year begins. Um, so I will ask that question. Uh, at this point, we've put out who would like to teach, so we have not yet heard back from parents, so thank you. Um, but I, I think it was Paul or Richard who said that there, Paul, who said that there was a, 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 a base, um, but we hadn't established a base yet. Yeah, and I think that this is probably a different answer for credit recovery or something like that than it is. We are offering fun programs at the middle school and the high school, and I want to say they're at about a dozen, um, that it, and, and or, um, I was going to say we max our classes out at like 15, but I I think that there must be some places that we're using different buildings and stuff because I I know for example there's like 25 that um, are in a learning uh, writing program at the high school and and in that particular instance that is a teacher that works with those students during the normal part of the year I think some of them are like newcomers who haven't developed haven't had a chance to to be exposed to language yet. Um, 
Uh, and so anyway, there's a lot of outreach that I think went on with teachers in some of these programs to go out and say, hey, come do this. It's going to be a good time. Um, but we were at about 12 was the cutoff if, if you got 12 people interested. And then one of the interesting things I think about it, too, is we're not necessarily signing people up to all, like ours is a month. We're not signing them up necessarily for a month. The ag program at our high school is doing um, four different sessions, and each of the four ag teachers is going to take a week. The um, counselors are going to be on st on campus working with the students to their, their uh, academic calendars and the master calendar, but each counselor is going to take a week. Um, so we really split it up and let pe different people do it, and then in terms of we opened it up not just to credentialed teachers to sponsor these. So that was another way for us to get staffing. Thanks. Um, and Paul, you mentioned something that um, I just want to highlight um, for folks, and it's, it also um, intersects a little bit with what um, other presenters have shared. And this summer, um, when we're thinking about uh, learning recovery, one of the really important groups um, that we want to highlight is um, English learners. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one of the challenges we've heard in distance learning is um, how it's more difficult to offer um, the, the kind of um, verbal interaction that they would have if they were in a, in a normal pre-pandemic year. Um, and so, these programs that you're describing, whether it's on the academic portion of uh, the day versus the enrichment pieces, that really gives um, English learners an opportunity to have that um, oral fluency, that um, practice in a way that will help the transition into the new year. And I think that, um, Eileen, you talked about the dual language immersion Piece, but I think that English learners in general will really benefit from the opportunity to um, interact with their peers and teachers around academic and enrichment um, content. So really want to highlight that for our members. Want to thank Jessica, Paul, Richard, and Eileen for their time today, both in preparing um, some descriptions for you, as well as their insights throughout their presentations and, and support. Um, before we close out, I just want to share some CSBA resources that are available. Those of you who attended uh, today's webinar will be receiving an email that includes a recording of this webinar as well as the slides, which is one of the reasons um, our panelists included hyperlinks within the slides, so you will have that as a resource for you um, moving forward. It will also be posted on our YouTube channel, which um, has a range of um, resources for you, including some uh, videos that we have done in the past on summer learning. We also have a summer learning page. Um, much of it focuses around work that we've done, um, particularly in terms of STEAM and summer learning um, that was funded through some grant work. But there are really important resources in terms of doing needs assessments and um, you know, thoughts around state, uh, staffing and partnerships. And so I want to direct you to that as another research, resource for you. And finally, um, as I mentioned at the start of this, this is the first of two webinars that we're doing around um, learning recovery um, funding and ways that we can impact students. Next week's webinar is Tuesday, May 4th, and it will be at the same time, uh, 11 a.m. Uh, so please feel free to register for that one as well. Thanks again to everyone for their time and have